My dad went on vacation with his dad and mom and his sister, and one of the places they stopped on this vacation was the Bonneville Salt Flats. My dad decided that this, this is what he wanted to do with his life. He wanted to go to Bonneville. Now, he was little, he was only seven or eight years old, but it was the start of a dream, the start of a dream that, that lasted basically an entire lifetime. And now you're talking about a guy, a working man, working at the LA Times, buying junkyard parts, has a good buddy named Fritz Voigt. And Fritz Voigt, that they come from they drag racing together and at the dry lakes together. And so these guys come together and they want to go fast. Now they go went out there and went, oh, I can't remember, 200 and something miles an hour and had the fastest car at Bonneville. Now that really fueled the deals for 400 miles an hour. They wanted to beat the Brits. The Brits were the standard of land speed racing. They had all the records, all the fast records. So now here's my dad and Fritz. They're buying junkyard parts, uh, old engines, Pontiac engines. They take four Pontiac engines. They set them on crates and two by fours in the middle of the floor. They take chalk and they run a chalk line all the way around the all the way around these four engines. They figured this is how long we want the wheelbase to be. That's where the chalk line stopped. And uh, take all these components. And now how do you make all those components work? You have to take different transmissions. You got one throttle pedal with 32 injectors hooked to it. You got one shifter that's got to shift four transmissions. Now here's some guys that are basically, I wouldn't say they were uneducated. They were academically uneducated but they were absolutely practical geniuses. They take this car, blood, sweat, and tears, making this thing work. My dad's working at night at the LA Times so he can have daytime to, uh, to work on this stuff. My mom's doing valve jobs on the engines, pulling engines out of the car for my dad so when he gets home from work, he's got all the stuff laying there and he can work on it and get right to work and not waste any time. So these guys, innovative, they take it and they go up to Bonneville and they can't get to 400 miles an hour. They have four fuel-injected Pontiac engines on nitromethane, but they can't get to 400 miles an hour. What do we do now? Okay, next year we're coming back. We're putting four superchargers on this thing. They come back 406 miles an hour, fastest Americans ever. Nineteen sixty-two was the first year that my dad, Mickey Thompson, went to Indianapolis. Now, Indianapolis—that's the epitome of racing. And for a California hot rodder to go to Indianapolis, I mean, it's one thing to go and watch and maybe go work on a crew and something, but go back there with your own car that you designed and built—I um, mean, that was pretty incredible for a hot rodder, to, a California hot rodder, to go do that. And my dad was, he went back there with the, the things that he came up with were just incredible. The aerodynamic devices. He was the first, he had ground effects or maybe they were ground defects, but ground effects back, all the way back in, in 1962 and three and um, came up with a wing, had a rear wing on the car. Um, the aerodynamics of the flow of the bodywork and the flow of the radiators and how the air went to the brakes. And he was so far ahead of his time with everything. I mean, he went back there with, in, in 1963 with a car that he built with a titanium chassis, a magnesium engine, the car weighed under a thousand pounds, like 968 pounds. All the other cars were over, well over 2,000 pounds and they were all front engine. His was rear engine. Everything he did was completely different. He went back there, built a tire, a low profile tire that was only a 12 inch rim. I mean, this thing was like 12 inches wide, only a 12 inch rim, and everybody else had in tires that were like 33 inches tall and four inches wide. I mean, it, was, it wasn't like a little bit different. It was a radical departure from anything that went on. And here's this California hot rodder at Indianapolis with radical departures, and he didn't come through the USAC dirt car ranks. And uh, he was not really, I think he was way, way, way too radical. And he had, a, he had a really hard time and a tough time when he went back there with this car that weighed under a thousand pounds. There was no weight limit in Indianapolis. That month, they decided the cars had to weigh whatever it was, 2,500 pounds. So now how do you take a car that you've designed to weigh under 1,000 pounds and bolt another 12 or 13 or 1,400 pounds on it and make it go work? 
now all of a sudden you're overstressing the tires that you built, the little small 12 inch tires, to work on a light car. So everything he did was so innovative and so advanced in time, but they kept messing back with him, they being the USAC officials. So it was just, the man was just incredibly ahead of his time in everything he did. You think about the name Mickey Thompson, well I think about the name Mickey Thompson, I think about it in all forms of racing, but drag racing was certainly a really, really big part of my dad's life. And my dad became the builder and manager of Long Beach Drag Strip, or Lions Drag Strip, when he was only, I'm not sure exactly, 27, 28 years old, he got the job. It was a start of organizing drag racing and starting to get the kids off the street and, uh, and come in. Now, they had uh, how they, started the thing as they had a guy out there with a flag and he would look at both guys and then he would wave this flag well then my dad was figuring out well these guys have got the starter figured out and they can see just before he drops a flag that he flinches and they go right when he flinches and they get the advantage over the next guy so he came up with a christmas tree lighting system first it was just a single light bulb out there and when the light went on then you left the start line then it became multiple lights yellow 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 green so that was another thing that came out of those first early drag racing days is the development of the Christmas tree, which is still used today in drag racing. And then uh, the timing systems. Now guys were out there running cars and they were, maybe they were spinning the tires on the start line or maybe they were spinning the tires at the other end, but they couldn't quite tell where their car was working in the middle, only visually and all of his friends telling him, yeah, the tires were smoking at mid-track. So my dad came up with segmented timing. So at the 60 foot mark, he put a, a timing light. At the 330 foot mark, he put a timing light. Now you can see how hard you launched off the start line to the 60 foot, whether the middle of the track to the 330 foot, you were on it or you were spinning the tires, and then what you were at the finish line. So you could actually sit there and study where your car was working and making adjustments for it. And then, uh, and then one of the things, and, and this was when I was young and I really, really enjoyed was the funny car days. He took the funny car thing, he says, what can I do to get the factories involved? What can I do to get Ford excited? Not just run a Ford engine, but a Ford engine, how many people really know what the engines look like? But a Mustang body, they know what a Mustang body looks like. They can associate that. And so he got Ford involved in, in 1968 and 69 in our funny car projects with uh, Danny and Gaius driving for him. And in fact, we called, we called that particular funny car Old Blue or Killer because it went out there and it won everything. It won all the national events and, and the Thompson and Gaius combination was just very, very potent. So once again, so you, so you go from uh, building a purpose-built drag strip to Christmas tree lights, to timing systems, to the slingshot dragster, to funny cars. It's got Mickey Thompson written all over every single segment of that drag racing era. Mickey Thompson Off-Road Racing. Where did it all start? Started down in Baja. My dad went down and ran a race with Bill Strop in one of Strop's multi-purpose. Uh, I think Strop had about 10 vehicles down there that year. Now this is early on in off-road racing. And my dad went down there and he drove a pickup truck. Danny and Gaius was his co-driver. And the uh, pickup truck had a six cylinder in it. And so they were down there and they were down there flying down these dirt roads and really, really thought they were cutting a fat one and they, they pretty much had the world, just had the world and they were just going. And they got to this smooth section and uh, here comes four Mexican guys in a 64 Chevrolet and they passed my dad and Danny on this smooth section. That, 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 that just, my dad said, okay, from now on I'm building my own cars, they're having big V8s in them and we're gonna go fast. So then it went on to, he started building his own cars. I became the co-driver with him, made maps and, uh, you know, did tire designs and, I mean, every single thing was an invention all the time. What can we do different? What can we do to make this happen? What can we do to make that happen? They got stuck that first year. And um, he's going, what can I do to get, you know, get this car unstuck? And you got, you know, logs that you put under it or sand or, you know, whatever you're stuck in. My dad comes up with the, the sidewall of the tire. If the thing's stuck in the sand, the sidewall of the tire has got to be doing just as much good as the bottom of the tire. 
So he came up with the side biter. And it, I mean, it actually would drive you out of the hole. The side biter is still incorporated into Mickey Thompson tires today. And that was from all the way back in the 60s. So once again, always thinking about, you know, what he could do and how he could do it. So, and then all of a sudden the off-road racing deal was done. Now he comes in and he's telling us in the off-road shop, uh, we're gonna make our own off-road race association here. We're gonna call it SCORE. And I mean, this is just walking in off the street and it's like, now what do you do? I mean, you gotta come up with rules, what you can and can't do. You gotta have rules for every single class. You gotta have tires for everybody. You gotta, all of these things. And it was just Mickey Thompson sitting down talking. But the one thing that Mickey Thompson could really do is make things happen. He starts talking with so much enthusiasm on, on the people. People just come in in hordes and start building things. We, we wrote the rule book. We set up all the pits and all the stop signs and all the checkpoints and all the things. It was just another Mickey Thompson first. And so there's so many things that can happen out there in the desert and the and desert's such an amazing thing. And the things that happen out there are incredible. The stories that come back and you get these people talking about, wow, this happened and I made this 550 foot jump and da da da. Well, everybody's got a pretty good story and about half of them are lies, but so what can we do to make it so people can actually see this? They don't have to drive out in the middle of nowhere and be stuck for two or three days. My dad comes up with this idea. We need to take this concept and we need to bring it into an enclosed facility. Enclosed facility, what do you mean by that? Well, like the LA Coliseum. The LA Coliseum, where they have the Olympics, where the Rams used to play, and now you want to do off-road racing in there? How is that going to work? Well. We're going to come in there, we're going to bring 25 million pounds of dirt, we're going to take it in there, and we're going to mold and form our own chunk of Baja. And I'm sitting there listening with a bunch of other people, I'm going, my dad's lost it, you know, I mean, how can you do this? But once again, here he is, Mickey Thompson, all of a sudden there's trucks rolling into the stadiums, 25 million pounds of dirt, and you got trucks jumping up and down, you got people sitting in the stands, drinking sodas, drinking beer, eating hot dogs, going, getting up and going to the bathroom between races. I mean, he was so, once again, so innovative. He takes and he does a attention span survey. How long is the average person's attention span? Eight to 10 minutes. Perfect, that's how long we're gonna make each race. Each race will be eight to 10 minutes. They can get a full adrenaline rush, get up, go to the bathroom, come back and be ready for another one. Now we're gonna have six different classes, and 18 races in a two hour period and you can go home full of off-road racing.